bit cracky. Hi there, Jim. Good to have you with us today. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thanks, Andy. Great to be here. Yeah, brilliant. So, Jim, thanks for joining us on this producing results series. This is part of a broader piece of work that's going on with the TSSA, um, particularly in the area of you know addressing bullying harassment. Um, it's an area that we're very passionate about addressing, and we're talking to different people from different aspects of uh, industries and different walks of life to get that perspective. So, Jim, I know that you've got some, obviously as a performance coach and many, many other hats you wear, you've got a lot of extensive experience, but just today we wanted to talk to you specifically about your background around football and coaching, because I know you've worked in that area. So maybe if I could just ask you, could you just give us a bit of background, just give us your sort of, you know, a bit of your CV, if you like, around what you've done, who you've worked with in, in the world of football and coaching. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to have worked in football. I still do now. At the moment, I'm working part-time with a semi-pro club. I'm also working in other areas too, outside football, and have done for a long time. My football journey began uh, very young. I, I had aspirations to be, uh, I guess I, I had, I, I was talented in a few different sports, and, and football being one of them, or at least reasonably, uh, you know, talented. I had aspirations to maybe play in Europe one day, and, Originally, I sort of grew up in Australia and, and over in the UK. I think I realised that things weren't going to work out for me the way I wanted to as a performer. So I, I decided to turn my attention to coaching and I did a course. I was doing a course at Loughborough University in the UK called Sports Performance Conditioning. And it was through that that I got to meet a few people and I started working at a personal training centre in, in Surrey. Uh, and the person who owned that, he was also the conditioning coach of Crystal Palace Football Club. Now, what he would do is send me players that needed to get into sort of shape uh, mentally and physically. Now, at that point, I already had a background in studying things like neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis and other modalities, as well as the fit element. So I would take some of the players into my week, not just from Palace, but also from other clubs too, in and around London. And I'd help them mentally and physically. And some of them would go on to get some, some results. And so I'll give you one example. Like for example, uh, uh, Carlo Nash. So I, I trained him, the goalkeeper, who'd been released, I think, from a club in the Northwest in the non-league. He was a pro originally, but he got released from a, a pro club. And he played non-league, sorry, after being released. And I believe Palace picked him up. And he was like their, their second or third keeper. And, and you know, Dave Richardson, the, the, the fitness coach there, said, well, if you could train him once or twice a week. And so I would do that and incorporate mental techniques. And you know, he was putting his success going forward down to me by any stretch of imagination. This is an example of the work I would do. Um, and that sort of would lead me on to other opportunities, work with individuals. Um, and then until eventually I'd end up in situations where I sort of work with teams. I became, I guess, notoriously um, to, to go in and, and be the firefighter, so to speak. So if a team was struggling and needed to be turned around, then they'd bring me in to bring in various performance measures to go in there, and, and that was a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, until eventually I ended up uh, not too far away from where you are, working mm -hmm. for Barry. Um, so the, the role at, at Barry um, came about through Andy Hill, who was Man City originally, and I knew Andy, and he, set, he, was, he was sending players to work with individually. Um, and then Andy said, well, you know, we talked about getting involved in Barry. Um, and he'd left for one reason or the other. And Chris Casper took over. It's, it's Man United, Reading, Chris Casper as a YT manager. And we got on well. And Chris said, I'd like a role for the youth team. And I said, I'll help out. And I was lecturing at the time as well. And I helped out. And, and from there, um, we did really well at youth level, produced great players punched above our weight and we helped stabilise the club. Um, and then the first team manager got sacked and Chris got the first team job and he'd asked me to join him. I joined him with 10 points uh, adrift at the bottom of the league. We survived. Um, and I sort of left the club uh, a few years later, but I left on good terms. We are in the top six, um, stable. We produced a lot of players and we actually knocked Sunderland who was in the premiership uh, at the time of, of the, the, the League Cup. So I'd moved on to different things. So that's in a very small nutshell 
Um, obviously, you know, work for different clubs and so on and so forth. But that's sort of my sort of brief background. Right. So, wow, yeah, very broad as well, Jim. And what was it like? What was the sort of, would you say, the sort of the culture um, of leadership and management? What, what, what did you observe from, from maybe some of the club managers and, and some of the managers around you? What was the sort of general culture and style of the leadership and management that you're experiencing? Yeah, I think it's changed a lot over the years. I think um, back in the day, so to speak, and I had this conversation one time, I was doing some coaching in Florida, and, and Roy Evans, I don't know if you know, um, the list was before with Roy Evans, he was ex Liverpool manager. And uh, and I had this sort of conversation with Roy. We were actually on a boat in Florida with him while I was helping out on a coaching camp over there. And we talked about how, you know, he's Liverpool when he was manager there. And he had such a talented team, so to speak. But they, they kind of were just slightly off the pace behind Manchester United, uh, so to speak. But Roy, you get the sense, was a really. Um, Really open manager, really easy to get along with, but obviously, you know, when you went to be firm. But I think that it's quite different. Um, but I mentioned that because we talked about how things have changed over the years. I think back in the day, you, you, you had different styles, but the walls have changed place, obviously. Um, so I think that, you know, certain managers have had to embrace not just leadership, but also, you know, sports science, psychology. There's so much more to the game that it was, you know, back in the day. And that's not taking anything away from, it. it's just things change. So I think leadership styles have changed a lot too. So now um, if you look at some of the managers coming through and um, they, they seem to be more uh, open to conversation, more guided discovery. Um, and in my role as a broadcaster on radio, probably some of the interviews, some listeners to probably some of the interviews, I get to interview some of the greatest athletes, sports people, uh, people in all walks of life, including football, and that's evident in some of the interviews when I interview some of the more um, the the more modern, if you want to call them managers, they're more like we're having a conversation now, and you know, just a, a nice, calm conversation with the players, and it's a long way away from the old ranting and raving. And there is a place for that. Don't get me wrong; I think there is a place for that. You know, to wait hard to leave and so on and so forth. But I think the science that a big impact on the way we interact with people, we realise that. To get the best out of people, um, you, you've got to individually manage the person and understand the person as an individual. And that's, that's the sort of key thing. So I think for me, um, the styles have changed from more uh, autocratic to democratic to more um, guided discovery. So in a dressing room now, at half time, if I was a manager, a manager would be saying to the players, what are your thoughts? What do you think you could do better? That's not always, obviously, you know, if you're sort of being played off the park, you might get a bit of ranting and raving, but for the most part, they recognise that, okay, um, let's sort of um, see and, and, and get the players to more resourceful state and appreciate that it only takes some information in such a short space of time. So we've seen change in styles over the years, and, and I think that's been based on um, how we understand, how we process information, and, and obviously changes too in society. Um, you know, for, for good reason, um, there's been obviously, um, you know, we've had various um, changes in academia, child protection laws in terms of the way, uh, you know, people are spoken to. But like a lot of things, sometimes it, there's knee-jerk reactions. So obviously, you know, when I went to school, for example, Andy, I, I had a teacher, if I didn't do my homework, she'd come behind me and slap me on the head. And, you know, you, you'd get like the cane. And so thankfully that's been eradicated. But then there is a sort of fine line between, okay, being firm. So I think in one respect, perhaps, you know, at the point of when they started introducing things like non-competition in schools and everyone wins, that might have been one bridge too far, but you've got this sort of generation that's sort of come through. Is, is mm. When you graduate, you hit the big wide world, it's, it's unforgiving, bruising world. And there's no more bruising world than the world of football. It is ruthless. It really is. There's only so many managers that can manage and so many players that can make it. I think there is a place for, or there is a time for, you know, being firm but fair, you know, tough love. Yeah. Um, so I think there's all these, all these multifactorial things that sort of change the demographic and, and, and the styles in leadership for me. That's really interesting, Jim. I mean, you've, you've hit on something really key, which is that whole area of there is a time for a bit of tough love. Um, as well as the democratic discussion-based um, 
interaction. Just out of interest, you know, in, in your journeys, I, I know it's really hard to say because you probably experienced a range of it, but back in the day, were you getting more of the tough love? Were you seeing more of the tough love? Or, you know, what sort of styles were you really experiencing, would you say? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, growing up, I grew up in a tough working class environment. And I interviewed on the radio recently, you know, a guy called uh, Jeff Fenniger, world champion boxer, one of the greatest boxers of all times. Uh, you know, Jeff, we sort of talked about this on air. And off there, that how things have changed in boxing from when he was sort of around. And, 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 and sort of Jeff, in one sense, he, he, you know, grew up not too far away from me, sort of uh, working class Sydney and, and an ethnic melting pot for, you know, uh, migration. And, and, you know, we, we grew up in, 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 you know, in a tough environment because, you know, uh, parents worked in factories and I suppose for me growing up, I was working in a factory at 14. 15 to help pay the bills and we were as poor as you could be in modern uh, society um, in that respect and, and I think it was a great um, learning you know working in, in a dusty factory in, in the middle of summer in, in, in you know 40 degree heat um, with no echo or anything like that was, was was a breeding ground for you know the realization that okay um, I'm gonna be wrong in my people who work in those environments it was tough and you know and, and and for me, it, I would say tough love for me, absolutely. You know, I had strong people, strong characters. And I had a coach actually who sort of took me under my wing, uh, took, took me under his wing at about 17, 18, because I lacked a lot of confidence, limiting beliefs. I had very severe asthma as a child, and that really impacted my confidence. I spent a lot of time in A&E with asthma and, and a lot of issues. And, that impacted my sort of confidence as well. And, and he took me under, under his wing and he, he really helped me a lot. He was really firm, you know, and that helped me. It wasn't softly, softly by any stretch of the imagination. And sort of, you know, said to me, if you want to sort of progress in life. And that sort of led me to the field of NLP and I'd sort of look for people and mentors and Tony Robbins seminar. I went to see him when he was in Sydney at the time and read his books and, and thought, well, actually, you know what? Um, I'm going to have to dig deep. It's me and only me that can get myself out of the situation I'm in because I felt like a rubber ship at one point. I was just drifting along, and, you know, where do I go? What do I do? And, and I thought at that point, tough love really worked for me. Um, so that sort of stayed with me in my approach to be, you know, I'm the most democratic person in coaching and, and like we're discussing ideas here, but there was a time when I sort of put my foot down too and said, okay, um, you know, let's, let's dig deep, let's roll our sleeves up here and get through this issue, yeah. uh, which is key. So probably my last question, Jim, is around how did you help players thrive? You know, what, surviving and this thriving. And so, you know, what, what did you notice really helped players thrive? Yeah, I mean, there's no sort of two players the same and every individual is different. To give an example, you mentioned there, you know, different teams. I, I'll use a sort of classic example, um, and I'll use it because obviously um, yourself being, being not too far away from, from, from Barry and, and my time at Barry, like say, for example, there's a lad there um, who the listeners will probably be familiar with, or, um, if they're in and around the area, Colin Kazim Richards, and he'd been released from various clubs in, in, in down south. I believe he was released by Arsenal West Ham. I don't know, so the story goes. And, and, and sort of Colin was sort of problematic. Um, in his in behaviorally to a point, um, which is why he ended up at Berry, or he would have, you know, obviously, you know, no disrespect to the club, he was very talented and, and, and he'd been released from Premier League. And Andy Hill took a chance on him and, and gave him an opportunity, I believe. And, and then sort of Chris took him under his wing. And, and I'm not sort of putting his success down to me as many factors. I mean, there's probably far more coaches have influenced on him than I had, but. I use this as an example because he would then go on and play in the Premiership and, and play for Fenerbahce, play for Champions League, play for, for Turkey. He opted to play for Turkey, I believe, national team as well in the end. But and one of the things is is, is what was evident there is is he had belief in the ability, but the point was is that could you sort of navigate that ability, channel it in some way. Um, he is a player that could have easily been lost to the system, but he had good people like Chris Casper around him, um, you know, uh, some good pros around him. 
and, and, and I think that's really important to sort of fine tune. I mean, his character is what it was, and it was what it was. And I think, for me, it shows how there's strong characters around an individual. Then, then they can thrive and, and go from probably being released and, and sort of going into the oblivion um, to sort of thriving. And, and I sort of took that ethos into corporation. And, and you know, when I wrote Excel Business, which was a bestseller, what I did is I took some of these principles and years ago, long story short, I went to a corporation. They said to me, can you help us with our business? And I said, well, what do you want to improve? And they, they showed me these things. Uh, and you know, they said, here's a list of things. And they were KPIs. And I didn't know at the time what KPI was, key performance indicator. But I said, I'll take it home and study it. And I studied the KPIs extensively, being meticulous and leaving no stone unturned. I studied them all night. and thought, well, these are um, external attribution in psychology and call external attribution. And, and I thought, well, how much control have you got over that? You can influence that. And I felt the manager was so focused on these KPIs, which are, which are essential. I, I liken them to a lead table, mm. where to be and climb the lead table in football, you can only do that by performing on the pitch. You can't control the referee. You can't control the weather. You can't control you know, other teams, but you can control what you do. So I went back to the manager and said, you know what, I put together the HPI. He goes, what in the world is HPI? I said, it's a human performance indicator. We're going to do um, some work around what makes it great. So I use psychometrics like the big five factor model, which is science based and, and many other things I've learned on my own journey of academia, which has spanned you know, however many years. And I thought, okay, we're going to focus on what makes a good leader, a good worker. Um, we're going to use scales um, to measure that, which is going to be difficult to quantify, but we're going to get the best out of people. So, okay, if I could approach every customer with gratitude, um, if I can focus on my strengths, and just cutting a long story short, the time I sort of built like a psychometric of my own, um, and, and, and we sort of smashed a number of um, sales records. Um, and, and that was sort of my insight to the world. And it, for me, it's about focusing on the person holistically. When I say holistically, I mean not, you know, wishy-washy. I mean uncovering every stone, you know, biopsychosocial, um, making sure that what we can cover, we do. So, you know, building a social environment that's conducive to success, um, using psychological strategies that can help the person. Um, you know, be the very best they can be, you know, extending our remit. And that was the sort of thing I'd do in football. I'd look at every uncover, every stone. Um, and, and, and because I'm quite a relaxed, easygoing character, I think there's been times that people sort of maybe underestimated, um, not professionally, they, they, they knew, but, and, you know, other professionals, you know, know how meticulous I am but from the outside in. You know, when you turn up, um, you know, to, to a corporation in jeans and, and you know, a, a short sleeve t shirt, and, and people think, well, okay, but that's sort of my style, really. and, and you know, I suppose that kind of mask in one respect that sort of deflects from my, 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 my performance. That's one thing I've been really good at doing so sort of to, to draw away the pressure off them and think, what's this person all about? So you go into a corporation, they think, okay. Um, so taking the pressure off the, the staff and, and the football is a big thing that I would do uh, for me, uh, which, which, was, which was a huge thing. I mean, that's sort of pretty much my style where, you know, I'll take the pressure off them and, and, and let them go out there and be the best they can be. Let the footballers, the sports people be and enjoy it and be the very best they can be. And that's been a process that I've sort of mirrored in corporation and in academia. Uh, and you'll see, like, you know, in the term now, all these emails I get through academia saying, you know, you've been very supportive and under challenging times, you've been great and we've got through the program. And, and I don't want to, you know, take any, anything away from the learners by any stretch of the imagination, but that's one thing I've adapted in academia, uh, in business, and I've taken that from sport. And I've been very fortunate to work with so many great 
managers in football and outside the game as well. And I've learned from every individual and I've just formulated my own style and that's where I am at the moment. Thank you so much, Jim. That's been so insightful um, and I really look forward to us connecting more with you throughout the rest of the series as well. Um, and obviously later on in the month, we're going to be looking to get you back for another conversation where there's an opportunity for a live audience to explore some of the insights and some of the things you've shared with us. So thank you so much, Jim. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Adam. You too. All the best. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You too. Thank you.